welcome to Navigating the French, the podcast where each episode, we look at a French word and try and see what it tells us about French culture. I'm your host, Emily Monaco. Today, I'm chatting with Loïc Bordeaux, an associate professor of French and Francophone studies and feminist and queer studies at the University of Louisiana in Lafayette. He's here to discuss one of the banes of every French learner's existence and an essential quality in modern French identity politics, genre. Welcome, Loïc. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you so much, Emily, for having me. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself and about your research? Yeah, so I'm associate professor in French and Francophone studies at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, and I work mostly on 20th and 21st century uh, Quebec and France literature, and both, uh, I mean, both literature and cinema with focus on LGBT studies and uh, queer studies and feminism. So really all the things that are new, if you watch Netflix and Emily in Paris or, you know, Lupin, for instance, these are things that are very of interest to me to see the representation of gender and race. So yeah, that's, that's what I do. Amazing. And today you're here to discuss a really important word, both for your research and just for anyone who's learning French in general. And that word is, of course, genre. So French is a gendered language in a way that is far deeper than English is. So for people who don't speak French at all, they might be surprised to learn that unlike, you know, in English where we'd say he or she or they, depending on a person's pronoun, and then it for concrete noun, like a table or a chair. In France, gender is really pervasive just from a linguistic perspective. Yeah, so that's and, really difficult <laughs> to yeah, learn. It is. It is. And you know, this is something when we do as like teachers, when you when you do the very basic French course and students ask you, well, how do you know? Well, truth is we do not know. We just grow up with it. And then, and then we just learn how they are uh, because there is no... I mean, there there are some rules, you know, we tell students usually if it's like a science, it's going to be a feminine pronoun, but th there is, yeah, really no rule. And we really need to like make a difference between grammatical gender and gender identity. Like these are two very different things. Uh, and it's important because when you said table, table in, in French is going to be la table, so it's going to be feminine, but it doesn't warrant that table any feminine qualities or like has nothing to do with femininity or masculinity um so that's really two things that we need to look into and that's romance languages overall if you look at spanish and italian uh that's just how they were constructed and that's just how they developed uh you you have yeah the two genders in, in german it's interesting because you still have uh, masculine feminine but you also have a neutral determinant or pronoun so, yeah, for English speakers, that, that is always something very new and kind of disturbing. Yeah. And aside from just those memorization issues that you mentioned, I remember when I was first learning French, you know, you'd try and come up with shortcuts and mnemonics, and sometimes it just seems to make absolutely no sense. But an, another sort of issue that we have with that is that because every noun in French is gendered, gender ambiguity is really difficult to convey in French. So for example, in English, you can really easily say my friend or my cousin or my sibling or my spouse, and you don't have to choose a gender in your speech. So you can keep that really quiet to the person that you're speaking with. And French right. makes this a lot harder. So what sort of are you seeing as the repercussions of that being this difficult? For example, in people who don't necessarily want to out themselves by saying that their spouse is the same gender as they are, or how people might find it uncomfortable with gender expression if they don't ident if they identify as non-binary, for example. Right. Yeah, this is this is very hard. And this is where there is this turn right now in linguistics. And uh, here I have to talk about my, my friend and colleague, Chris Nisley at the University of Arizona, who is doing all that work trying to do this like trans affirming French linguistics to make sure that it's more gender neutral and uh, and and also affirming of everyone's identities. Uh, there are small ways, I guess, right now on top of my head, I couldn't remember, for instance, you were talking about friend. Um, so there is one way in France where you, you talk about your girlfriend or a boyfriend, you will say just mon ami. And because there is 
because Ami starts with a vowel, mon will be the same whether it's boy or girl. So that's kind of like a way to like say something without saying something. But otherwise, yeah, you're you're kind of you're you're really stuck. And I, I I mean I think there is also a different relationship with coming out in the French context that also needs to be accounted for. I know that in the U.S. and being in the U.S. I haven't been in the U.S. for so long. There there is a there is a performance of coming out that you have to come out. Um, it's a big step. It, in France, it's very different. Like you you. You don't really come out. I mean, you you do to some extent, but I feel like uh, just one day you you tell your parents, "Oh, I'm with this person. They happen to be a boy or a girl or non-binary, whatever," and that's kind of it. That's kind of how you make your coming out. It doesn't have much deeper implications. Uh, in the U.S., it has because you're part of a community. But as we know, France does not like communities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I mean, and France also kind of perceives America and I think to a certain extent justly as being extremely performative like France doesn't really necessarily have like a graduation ceremony or like a sweet 16 birthday party or a prom so like that what you're describing as like oh this is my girlfriend this is my boyfriend this is the person that I'm with that's kind of what I'm seeing among like Gen Z queer people in America as like this bypassing of that coming out that was so important in American society for such a long time. Right. And oftentimes, you know, when I, do, when I, when I teach like feminist studies or queer studies, we always talk about uh, how identity politics were very important for the civil rights movement of the 70s. And, you know, it's very important. Like it's still in the U.S., it has great power, but it also has limitations, which is that you're part of the group. And then the identity that you present, it's going to be limited because if you think back about gay marriage in the U.S., the HRC, the Human Rights Campaign, they had to kind of say, okay, well, we'll put aside trans rights for now because we can only focus on presenting a good image of gay people so that they can get marriage. But that's not, that, that's not good enough, you know, to put aside transgender health care and all these, all these things. And, and then on the opposite side, you have the French system that says you're a French citizen before anything else and your identities, religious or sexual orientation, sexual identities, gender identity, they are not represented. Race is not represented. Uh, and that's a problem because you don't know who the people are. And so when you try to represent them or talk about them, you are, you are limited in, in, yeah, the vocabulary that you have access to. Absolutely. One thing I've noticed because that vocabulary is so limited in France that is that we're seeing French queer and feminist activists directly borrow American terms. Like I've seen uh, LGBT groups in, in France using the word queer, like just pronouncing it with a French accent. Do right. you think that, I mean, do you think that that's why? Is it, why are we so devoid of a vocabulary to discuss these issues in France? Is it because we weren't discussing them? I mean, I think that there's always been a turn towards the U.S. to kind of like borrow the culture. I mean, this is U.S. imperialism, you know. Uh, it goes from McDonald's to language. And that's mm -hmm. something that has happened for decades. And because, again, French language is kind of limited in what it offers, uh, yeah, we turn to the U.S. But also what's interesting is that that U.S culture and it has been built upon French intellectuals and French scholarship. Uh, I mean, feminism is Simone de Beauvoir, 1949. Then it goes and it is exported uh, in the U.S. You look at Fanon and post-colonial uh, studies, again, France, and then it goes to the U.S. and it has really been very powerful in the U.S. in the 80s and 90s. And then it, it, it is making a return to France right now, and a lot of people, conservative people, are complaining about it, that we're exporting U.S. culture and it is putting French culture in danger. But that initial culture was French, you know, so it's like right. this funny thing right now. And that's been happening for such a long time. I mean, even if you look at the origins of both revolutions, like the American Revolution in 1776 and the French Revolution in 1789 right. are both built off of f French philosophers including some like Alexis de Tocqueville, who went over and visited America and went back, you know, you have all of this intermingling that's been happening for over 200 years. So it's no surprise that we'd constantly be borrowing and building off of each other. 
Right, and I'll say that U.S. pop culture is uh, also uh, much more daring. I think in, in the representation of identities, uh, I think it's much more on point with what's going on in the world and in the U.S. At least, not the world, but that's uh, yeah, really at least in the U.S. for sure. Um, and, and I teach a class that's youth and diversity in pop culture. And when I look at the amount of material that I can find, it's amazing. But then I look to France and it's extremely limited. So that's also the work I'm doing right now. When I say looking at Emily in Paris, what is the representation of France that this show is giving? Well, it's giving us a very white, privileged, uh, conservative France. But then you look at Lupin. Lupin is doing something much more interesting with the black lead. But at the same time, people are complaining that there are no black women. And that's a fact. There are no black women in Lupin. You cannot find black women. So France is going in the right direction, but it's really struggling. They did an adaptation of, I think it was called Transparence in the US, uh, and they called it Louise or something in France. And the way they did it was extremely problematic. The, the way they represented that trans character was problematic. And that's because of French republicanism, the way we see the individual. You know, we, we are struggling to articulate how to talk, uh, to talk about identities that are not gendered or just binary. We'll be right back with Navigating the French after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to navigating the French. You see that in, in a lot of this idea of the Republic and equality wanting to diminish people's individuality, at least on paper, so that everybody is a citizen first, and then whatever else they are, man, woman, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, black, white, second or third or fourth. But the problem is that a lot of people don't actually feel that way in their life. They don't feel like a citizen first because their other identities are making it uh, impossible for them to feel like a full, I mean, the, I guess because the default is, is as it is almost everywhere, straight white, straight white man, right? Even in the French right. Republic. Right. And the issue is that when this discourse is so powerful and so predominant, you really feel like your identities, your other identities are crushed. And this is just who you are, but you you can you don't fit because you don't have the right pronouns. So this is also what transaffirming linguistics is doing by saying, well, you can say yell or zel or you have these new pronouns that are being invented, uh, gender inclusive language is also quite important, and maybe we'll get back to this, but uh, it is giving this visibility, and people may not like it, but at least it's opening up the dialogue on, on this. You know, a lot of people are, are like, there's a lot of backlash on gender-inclusive language, but at least we're talking about it. We're showing that it is grounded in patriarchy and women's submission, and it's not just this gender-neutral language. And I think there's this moment of awakening, yes, with Gen Z, that they're trying they're much more fluid overall but also yeah they just they just want to be accounted for and recognized for for who they are and they don't see that on tv they don't see that in language so it is quite hard mm -hmm. and you were talking about feminine oppression and i think that's a really essential thing that we saw it's it's a little it's a little uh, it's kind of feels like old news now, which is awful because our news cycle is just so fast. But when the Me Too movement first sur first surfaced in the U.S., the reaction and some of the backlash from older French women, I'm thinking, you know, specifically of uh, Brigitte Bardot and Catherine Neuve, was almost as though like, oh, these Americans, they've taken it too far. But obviously, we've also had other women come forward and say, no, this is a really pervasive problem, even here in France, in the in the world of Simone de Beauvoir. Why do you think Americans are so willing to step forward with the Me Too movement? And it took time and effort and a lot of negativity, even from women within, I mean, other women in France for that to be to really surface and be talked about. That's a tough question. I think, again, it goes back to identity politics, because I think there's been so much in the US that has been built around a women's movement. I mean, there was something very similar, MLF in France, the liberation, the liberation movement for women in France that, that still happened. Um, but I think because the because a lot of of the politics, I guess, are not really built around gender identity, 
It is not as powerful. And there's this old idea in France that it's part of the culture. So when you talk about like De Neuve, you know, the response was to say, oh, people just don't understand what flattery is or like... Uh, I forgot the name, but like he was basically like galant. So it's like these weird, he was just a gentleman or, or it's going to be terrible now. Men will, will not be able to catcall us pretty much. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it was, oh, no. it, yeah, I know. Right. And that's what, that's exactly what happened after the DSK, Dominique Troscan affair. And they, they did a documentary on Netflix. That's quite interesting. And looking back on it, it was like, wow, the, the French response was absolutely horrendous. Everyone right away believed this guy. And, and of course, the, the victim was lying and uh, there was some misunderstanding. I was like, wow, th th there is, yeah, there is a big struggle. I do think Me Too has allowed French women to emancipate and free themselves themselves to a certain extent. But you also need to put it back in the context of World War II, France collaborated with Germany and exterminated French Jews. And so there is this whole fear about what we call denunciation, denunciation, or turning in people. And that's kind of how the Me Too movement was perceived, which is, you know, it was balance ton porc, kind of like name your pig, name the mm -hmm. person that hurts you. And I think that act of naming is too reminiscent of the naming or the turning in people of World War II. So there's always this fine line that French people struggle with. That's so interesting. I never made that connection, but you're absolutely right. Like this collaborationists and the, the denouncers of World War II, it still feels really palpable in so many of the decisions we make in France, including the fact that we, part of the reason why we don't ask religious affiliation in official censuses is because the Vichy regime used that information to deport Jewish people during occupation. So, right. And I mean, the, the funny part is like French people do it all the time. You know, I just have to look at people that I grew up with and they're always talking about how they like told on other people because they were getting some benefits they should not get or because they're not taking care of that person so well. I'm like, you are part, you are engaging <laughs> in this culture. And then somehow when we, you have a group of women that are saying there's a huge problem, you do not believe them. Like that, that's, that's a problem because I think it's affecting this French idea of exceptionalism and being such a wonderful like culture and being so liberal because we are somehow built on the 18th century philosoph and, you know, and these values. But then you realize that the U.S., with all its flaws, is always 10 to 20 years ahead of French culture in terms of progressive ideals and values. So I, I have a friend who came to France in 2011, and she was attempting to do a joint degree at the Sorbonne in translation and gender studies. And the Sorbonne said to her, we don't have gender studies here. That, oh, that struck me as something that was like, wow, I feel like gender studies has existed in the US for a really long time in France as sort of this cradle of feminism it seemed so strange to me that that you that that wouldn't be especially as as such an intellectual society that gender would not have yet been intellectualized in one of the top universities in France at that point where would Simone de Beauvoir have sat in in French university studies pre the idea of a gender studies course where would you have read her uh, that's a, actually a good question. I was listening to like a philosophy teacher in high school and she was talking about some of these texts and I believe they were taught before in maybe literature uh, mm. or they were not taught at all. And if I think back on my philosophy classes uh, back in high school, uh, we did not do any woman philosopher, for instance. So I think it was kind of like niche and you had to know or you kind of had to be part of the culture. But yeah, to learn about it, that it was not in the official curricula. I think right now in France, I don't know how many. I know there's a, a master's in Lyon. I know there's a master's in Bordeaux. I think there's one now in Paris for sure. But again, it's taken 20 years at least to start these degrees. And what I get from colleagues in the teaching the degrees is that it tends to mostly attract 
women or students that identify as women or non-binary students or students who are gay. So that's usually the demographic. I'll, I think in the U.S. it's about the same, but there's more, I don't know, they're maybe more open or, you know, it's a requirement or so th there's a little more diversity in it. But again, it goes back to this French identity. Why do I need to focus uh, my work just on gender? You know, I'm a French citizen and that's it. We'll be right back with Navigating the French after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Navigating the French. Given what you've examined in media, both in the U.S. perception of France and in the French perception of themselves, how do you think most, I mean, it's so hard because it's such an overgeneralization, but how do you think French women are conceiving of themselves today? Do you think that they think about their femininity? Do they think about their womanhood? Or is it something that, again, like, like race, like religion is sort of tamped down in favor of just being a citizen? Yeah, I think it's a very, like, it's a very hard question also for me because one, I identify as a man. So, right. um, you know, the only, like, the only thing I get is from the women in my life and the French women in my life. And I think, I don't know, I think there's still, there's still a French feminine ideal that is there, but they're also very career oriented. Uh, I mean, I'm in a circle where none of the women I know want kids or have kids. Um, so yeah, there's something where they're just, they've always been driven by their education and by like professional success. Uh, they have, their own like personal lives, either boyfriends, girlfriends, or, you know, single and just enjoying single life. But I do think it's hard from what I gather. Sometimes I, I still get that there's this pressure and there are some podcasts, uh, Victoire Tuayon with Les Couilles Sur La Table or L'Amour Sur La Table. She's doing really some outstanding work giving a platform for these women to talk about what it's like, for instance, to be a woman and to date in today's France uh, and or to be in love because there's still a discourse that is telling you, well, you need to be with someone and you need to have a child. Um, I think there's, there's still some struggle for them. But again, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not one to talk. Mm -hmm. But then, then let's look at the other side of things because I think masculinity is starting to be something where – Men in the United States and even in the UK, I was just watching a really interesting talk about this year's Hay Festival in Wales. Men are starting to examine their masculinity and to examine notably toxic masculinity and sort of see the effects that a toxic masculine environment has had on men's mental health and their perception of themselves and their perception of their gender expression. Do you think that that's something that French men, by and large, are starting to feel or is that not really reached the French culture yet? Hmm, that is also like a hard one. Because um, I, I, I mean, you know, I'm an academic in an academic right. circle, and I have a very small pockets of friends in France and selected ones, I'll say. So therefore, they are wonderful people. But I do think that they're much more open. And I think, yeah, there, there's things are really changing. And I think pop culture is changing this too. Eddie de Preto, the singer, is really uh, doing great work with his like rap music and degenerating it or like detoxifying it, I guess. So there's this, Edouard Louis. But again, you see the work is coming from people who are gay too. So there is this struggle because these individuals that are trying to make masculinity less toxic, they're gay and therefore it's a hard model for straight men to identify with. So I do think, yeah, there's, yeah, it's not so great. But it is, it is evolving. And I think the younger generation is much more open, much more fluid. I see it here in the U.S., like many men wearing like nail polish, for instance, much more open about it and the way they dress. Uh, yeah, something still is is happening for sure. And there has always seemed to me, and this is, again, as someone who I've been living in France for 15 years, but I am, I do identify as a woman and I'm not French. I mean, I'm naturalized, but I'm not culturally mm -hmm. French. And so when I look at the way that men in France express themselves, even with their friends, for example, there's a lot more 
emotionality, I guess, sentimentality, yes. like men feel will men are willing to hug each other to give each other the bees. There's less this fear of being emasculated that I think is so pervasive in straight male culture in the United States. Like maybe yes. there was already a little bit of that embracing of those of those qualities in France. Yeah, and that's why if you ask me about the current moment, I'm not too sure, but I grew up with what you described. So, you know, for 34 years of my life, what what you say it is exactly what I grew up with. And then it was striking to me moving to the US to see this huge like difference. And this is actually great when I teach masculinities, for instance, to the students, because I show them two models and they see that a hegemonic or dominant model in one country is extremely different in another. If you think about the ideal masculine French man, it is the opposite of a U.S. masculine model. And most U.S. straight men would tell you, oh, that's a gay man, you know, or I spent time in the US and I went back to the UK. And so I dressed differently because I was in the UK and there was also much more fluidity in the UK. Then I come back at Christmas in the US and I was, I felt like all eyes were on me because of the way I was dressed. And it was extremely striking to see this difference. I think it is changing a bit, but it is true that the French model offers more, yeah, openness and affection and emotion. And I do think the U.S. can learn from this because studies have shown, and especially in the case of gay men, that they tend to be happier than straight men. And that's because I think they just don't care also. Like once they're out and enjoying life, the way their masculinity is, is just how they want to be. Whereas if you're straight, there is there is so much discourse about how you have to be straight, that you're constrained. And that probably is like a lot to deal with too. And that culture of extremes always does seem to feel super American to me. Like you look at the perfect 1950s housewife and then you look on like the pendulum swings and you get these like super feminist women who, you know, the bra burning and everything. It always feels like it has to be to from one extreme to the other. And there does seem, I mean, maybe that's what's meant that it's taken such a long time in France for these issues to come to light because there has always been a softer side to French masculinity and there has always been a powerful side to French femininity that maybe we didn't allow ourselves in the US. Yeah. Know, does that ring true to you? Well, it's an interesting point that you're making because I think, I mean, when when you think about France, it's the country of the revolution and like a country that is on strike all the time. So they're not afraid <laughs> of being radical. And then somehow when it comes to feminism, they have this lukewarm response, which I find troubling. And whenever it goes to a more radical side, then that's when they start blaming the US. So oftentimes on French radio, I hear um women being asked are you a feminist and they struggle to respond and they're like yeah but like the recent one was oh yeah but i'm much more of a humanist you know i'm for the equality between men and women and i'm like well this is feminism <laughs> uh mm -hmm. and she says i'm a humanist because she thinks that when she says i'm a feminist it is the bra burning like feminazi and that's the image that she has and therefore she doesn't want to be associated with this but i think there is also that's also part of media portrayal because uh i think the yeah the bra burning and the feminazis are a or even like femen they are such a small percentage of the overall feminist movement how we represent feminism in france impacts the overall movement we know that sensationalized images sell more. So that's also a reality. And that I think that's deserving of disservice to the French feminist movement. But again, I think it's changing. And I think that like podcast culture uh, and some TV shows are doing something really positive to, to that. Well, thank you so much for joining me for this conversation. It has been enlightening. I have one last question for you before I let you go. And that is, what is your favorite word in French? Oh my gosh, that is a very, I don't know. That, you know, that is very hard. I've been like living in the US for so long. You know what? I'll give you my favorite English word, which is breach. And I don't know why. 
I love breach, but, breach? and I think it says a lot. Yeah. B R E A C H. Cause I think okay. I'm all about transgression and culture. So I think that's a good one. And the sound is perfect. Uh, but the French one, I, I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. how about maman? This is just a shout out to all the mothers because I work on motherhood and I just, I'm always in awe of everything that women and especially mothers do. So there you go. <laughs> Excellent choice. Where can people find you? Where can people find your work? Are you on social media, Instagram, Twitter? Yeah, I'm on Twitter. You can find me at Loic underscore French. Perfect. Easy to remember. All right. Thank you so much for joining me today, Loic. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Emily. Bye. Bye. This has been Navigating the French. You can find more from me, Emily Monaco, at Emily underscore in underscore France on Twitter and Instagram. This podcast is produced by Paris Underground Radio. To listen to more episodes of this podcast or to discover more podcasts like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com. Thanks for listening and à bientôt.